guys okay? You sure? All right. So, summer is here, and I'm trying to figure out how to squeeze out as much daddy-daughter time as I can. And I, I, I come here, and I do what I've got to do when I've got to do it, and, and I get out of here, and I'm, I'm a morning person anyway, so I start early, I run, and, I, and a lot of times I'll even do, if I don't have meetings here, I'll do my stuff here before I even go home and shower, which means you don't want to, you don't want a surprise meeting with me on run mornings, and uh, it may not smell the best in my office, but uh, I try to squeeze out some daddy-daughter time, and the only day this week we had where there was nothing else competing with the day was Tuesday, and so I told Hannah... I said, all right, we're going we're gonna to go somewhere today that we've never been, and we're just going to have some fun. And I, I'd heard about this little lake down in Tazewell um, that um, I'd forgot about. We'd planned on going a couple years ago, and I forgot about it. And uh, what's the name of that, that lake? Uh, Witten, lake Witten. And uh, so we're going to go down here there, and we're going to uh, ride the paddle boats and just hike and do some things. And some of y'all are very familiar with that area because that's your neck of the woods. A beautiful little lake there. Um, it's hard to find someone that works there to help you out, but it's a beautiful little lake. So we're trying to get, squeeze as many miles out of my wife's Kia as we can before we turn it in in a couple months. And we have to stay local with it because as some of you know, we've had issues out of that car. It was a lemon and we can't trust taking it on long trips. So Taswell's close enough. I thought, well, if I can't make it there, Pastor Tim's here, and he can uh, come and get us. And so I did what I often do before I go somewhere. I went to the store to buy oil for the car. <laughs> and Jackie, I found out it doesn't matter if you put expensive oil, cheap oil, regular oil, synthetic oil, it doesn't matter. It goes through the oil. I've had it to two different Kia dealerships, and they well, we, have, we can't see anything wrong with it, Mr. Catron. Or as they called me yesterday at the race, Mr. Catron. That was a new one. I hadn't heard that one before. So uh, I have found the cheapest place to buy oil is Roses. So we went to Roses and I bought two quarts of oil, one to put in it to bring it back up where it needs to be, and one to carry on board in case I need another quart before I get back from Tassel, <laughs> which it's not quite that bad. But I do carry one with me just in case. So we went to Roses and I, I, I went in, I got some oil and I popped the hood in the parking lot and and... Um, I put the oil in, and then I pulled my, my funnel out, and I wrapped it back in plastic and put it in my trunk and put the empty container in my trunk. I went back around, and I closed the hood. I said, all right, let's go have some fun. And so I started the car up, and it's like, well, that sounds weird. And I started going across the parking lot. It's like, well, I've never heard that sound before. How can something change just because I put oil in it? We start up the road, and I'm hearing this weird winding noise coming from the engine that I've never heard before in my life. I said, Hannah, do you hear that? And she said, yeah, that doesn't sound right. I said, well, all I did was put oil in it. How bad can it be? I mean, so we just kept going, and we kept smelling burning oil. I said, well, some oil must have dripped off of that funnel onto the engine. And by the time we got to Green Valley, I thought, well, that should have burned off by now, and it's getting worse. And we started up the hill past the mall and went up the hill there, and we were just about there to the exit where the old Kmart is, and the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. Why he didn't do it sooner, I have no idea. <laughs> he said, hey, dude, you forgot to put the oil cap back on. I said, I'll bet you're right. <laughs> he almost always is. <laughs> so I pull into the old Kmart parking lot, and I pop the hood, and oil is everywhere. Jackie, you ever do, have you ever done that before? Forgot to put the oil cap? Anyone here ever forgot to put the oil cap on? And you hear this noise because it's coming up through the, through the hole where the oil cap's supposed to be, and the compression of the engine is pushing oil out everywhere. So I said, baby, our, our, our journey has just been altered. And I got a bunch of napkins that was in the door of the car, and I stuffed down in the hole. And I started heading back to Princeton. I said, baby, I don't know where we lost that cap, but we'll never find it on 460. But the Kia dealership's on the way, and we'll stop at the Kia dealership, and I'll see if by chance they have a, a, an oil cap in stock. And, you know, you know what an oil cap's going to cost the dealership, you know, somewhere between two and $300 for a, a $6 oil cap. So we got close to Green Valley, and something in my spirit just say, just go back, return. Return back to where you were. Return back to that place where you 
filled that motor with oil, and it was good to go. And so we started up the courthouse road there and said, now just watch the road here. If it's out in the road here, we're back on two lane. We might see it out in the road. And, of course, we didn't see anything. We got back into Princeton, and I got to the red light there where Emmett's Barbecue was at, and I went to turn, and there in the road was a seraphim with six wings. Glowing, the glory of the Lord shone about. And she stood there just pointing down at the ground. And there was my oil cap. And it was right on the line. There's, of course, you know, there's three lanes of traffic right there. And so I pulled at Emmett's barbecue and I said, Baby, I've got to get my cap. And she's like, Well, how are you going to do that with all these cars? And, and I'm just waiting now for a car to finally hit the cap and destroy it right as I find it. And I'm waiting, I'm standing by the road. You know, it's a small town. I kind of stand out in the crowd. A lot of people know me. And everyone's going by and blowing the horns like, hey. And I'm just standing there right almost in traffic. And just like, how you doing? And they had to be thinking, what is this fool doing? So I finally get a small gap. Hannah told me later she had her phone out getting ready to call her mommy at the hospital saying, get ready, they're going to bring daddy in. I run out there and I grab that oil cap and I run back, get out of the way just in time. And then I get my extra quart of oil out because that's about what I lost. And I fill it back up with oil and I go to the car wash and I clean all the engine off and it looks brand new again. I say, all right, baby, let's get back on the road. Let's start this journey over. Um, we had to return back to where we started. We had to return. I want to tell you a story this morning about returning. And I hope that it resonates in some of your hearts. It's about a man named Jacob. And most of you know the story of Jacob and how Isaac wanted children so bad. It was just like his father, Abraham. It's like this family just is having issues with kids. And so Rebecca's pregnant and it's twins and the first one that comes out is Esau and coming out right behind him literally the Bible says holding to his heel is Jacob they named him Jacob it meant supplanter which means to meant to supplant something to take something's place but then it was changed to mean grabber one who grabs and Jacob was the grabber um, historically it was Esau who was the first out, so he technically was the eldest son, so he would have the birthright, and he would have the choice blessing from his father Isaac. But Jacob was a grabber. And so most of you guys know the story of when Esau goes out to hunt. Jacob was a mama's boy. He stayed around the tents, the Bible said. He stayed around home, and him and his mama really bonded. Esau was just out there, and he was a hunter. He went out to hunt one day, and he and he came back, and he was famished. He was so hungry. And Jacob saw an opportunity, and he said, Hey, I'll, I'll trade you some soup here for your birthright. It's lentil soup. The, the, the story is full of symbolism. You know, soup isn't something that's meaty. It's, it's watered down. The symbolism is powerful because Esau is so captivated by his own soulish and fleshly demands. He's willing to trade his birthright for something that's just watered down. It, there's, there's just really no value even in that soup. He said, what good is my birthright? I'm about to die here. Just extreme. He, he, he became quite the drama queen. He said, sure, I'll, I'll sell you my birthright for a bowl of soup. And so Jacob grabbed the birthright. And then later on, Isaac became old and he was ready to die and he needed to bless his sons. And Jacob and his mama conspired to trick Isaac into believing that he was Esau. And Esau was a hairy man and so they covered him um, with goat hair and, and they made him smell like Esau. <laughs> and he went to Isaac and Isaac could not see. He was blind and, and so he gave the blessing to Jacob and so Jacob had not only grabbed the birthright, he grabbed the blessing. And Esau came back, and Esau was mad, and Jacob was afraid. And so his mama came to him and said, you need to hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back. No more, no more, no more, because your brother's going to kill you. 
And so Jacob packed his bags quickly and he left. And the plan that his mama came up with is that, you know, I have a brother living uh, about 50, 60 miles from here, your uncle Laban, and you need to go there and you need to hang out with him. And so Jacob starts the journey um, to find his new life um, in, a, in a, new, a new place where he'd never been with people he had never met. The story picks up now, a place I want to show you along the journey. It's at a place that will, that will be called Bethel. It would mean house of God. It's where the word Bethlehem came from, house of God. More technically, it meant the place of God. And here the story picks up in Genesis as he stops for the night. It says, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he went, he'd, he'd went to sleep, he used a rock for a pillow, and he was laying there sleeping. And what, what had happened is he had a dream, and he saw a staircase going from the heavens to the earth, and he saw angels uh, descending and ascending up and down on that staircase. He was having an encounter with God. The presence and the glory of God was there. It says, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head, and he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Bethel's a much better name. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And the stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. And he tithed to the Lord. This was a, an encounter with God. Jacob, you know, we don't know how to read the truth into these stories of the Old Testament because we read them through the filter of our knowledge of God, our, our knowledge of God's Word, our ownership of God's Word, having, having the luxury of having all these stories of God, all this information of God, and we run these old stories through those filters and, and, and we read things into it that just, they, they're just not there. I tell you all the time about Moses, and until Moses had the burning bush experience, Moses didn't have a clue who God was. He'd heard about God. He had, he had no personal relationship with God, no personal knowledge of God. And even though we have Abraham, and we have Isaac, and now we have Jacob, these guys don't have intimacy with God. They just don't. Jacob proved he had no connection with God because he was a deceiver. Yes, we read in the New Testament that God was pleased with him because he, he wanted his birthright so much. He wanted the blessing of God so much. And we're to be like Jacob in that regard, a grabber of our birthright. But the bottom line is the same. He was deceitful. He was a liar, and it came back on him later on, and he had to reap what he had sown he never had an encounter with God, and he comes to this place, and things are about to change. It's a story that you and I are supposed to relate to. Whether it happens when we're young or it happens when we're older, maybe we even grow up in church kind of like Jacob grew up in an environment with some knowledge of God, Jehovah, but never had a personal connection. And then you're in this place, and it may be a church service. And something happens, and you've, suddenly you find yourself in the presence of God. You're feeling things you've never felt. Something's pulling on you. Something's breaking in you. Maybe there was an altar call, and you couldn't resist. Something incredible happened in your life that day. How many of you guys can remember that? And if you can't remember that, then you will find yourself being challenged today if maybe there's something that you've missed. Jacob knew about God. He was kind of like Job. When Job at the end said, well, I knew all about God, but now I know God. 
Jacob knew about God, but he'd never been in the presence of God. By his own admission, this was an experience beyond what he even knew was possible. To have a place of, of, of intimacy with God, where God revealed himself. Jacob had never experienced that, and so he has the dream, and the dream isn't an, a normal dream. He's experiencing the presence of God, the glory of God in his dream, and he wakes up and he acknowledges that. He says, I have been in the place of God, the presence of God. I can remember my own life growing up in church and being in church services where in the, in the, in the Pentecostal environments, they just, uh, the presence of God was there and things happened. And, and I know sometimes we take jabs at that because there was a lot of fleshly stuff and a lot of soulish stuff, a lot of learned behavior going on in those environments, but there was a lot of real stuff too. But I mostly was, was just watching I was seated in the grandstands, and I was a spectator mostly. And I remember my encounter with God, though. I've shared it many times when I was shipped off to Bible college by my mom and found myself in a place where, goodness gracious, I just didn't know what to do with my life anymore. In the wee hours that morning, I left my dorm room and I went to the chapel because the males, the, the guys, could go to the chapel during the night and the girls had a different curfew. And I went and I laid myself face down on that floor, on that big old stage. Oh my gosh. Suddenly there was an intimacy with God. I knew that God was in that place. It was a turning point in my life. Jacob got up from that place. He anointed it, set it apart. Anointing is, is, just means to set apart. It's where we also get our word um, sanctify. It's also where we get our word holy. It means set apart. This place is set apart as the house of God, the place of God. And he had experience there. And there he was reminded of God's promises, the same promise that was given to Abraham. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to multiply you. Jacob left that place and he continued on his journey. And most of you know uh, where the story goes from here. He goes and he, he meets Uncle Laban and he meets his cousins, Leah and Rachel. It was different in Bible times. I'm not going to make any McDowell County jokes here because you're waiting on it, so I'm not going to because half of you guys came out of McDowell County and you're awesome. But there's stories in the Bible that are, are right out of a wrong turn movie, if you know what I mean. He sees Rachel and he, he falls in lust. I mean in love with her. The Bible says, ah, uh, Moses is the writer, and God's trying to give him inspiration how to record all this history. And he records that Jacob saw Rachel, and he was in love with her because she was lovely in form. Any of you guys ever fell in love with a girl because she was lovely in form? Any of you guys ever throw that one out when you were younger and single? See a good-looking chick and go, I'm in love. Yeah, he was in love. He asked Uncle Laban, what's it going to take for me to marry my cuz here? Because <laughs> she's lovely in form. <laughs> he said, well, you got to work for me seven years. And the seven years was up, and it was time to marry Rachel. But the trouble is, Leah's the oldest she had uh, culturally. She was the one that should get married first. Uh, she evidently was not lovely in form. And uh, <laughs> she had not found a husband so it's time for the wedding night. It's a whole different thing culturally how weddings took place. But Jacob finds himself in a dark wedding tent there to consummate the matrimony. And he can't see and he's probably a little bit drunk on top of that as that would have been custom. And he wakes up the next morning to find out that he had married Leah, not Rachel. Um, it was good that he married her because that's where most of the children ended up coming from between Leah and her handmaidens, he had a bunch of kids, 12 in all. Two of them did end up coming from, from uh, Rachel. 
Joseph the favorite and the last Benjamin um, between those two wives and their handmaidens. He had 12 sons. They became 12 tribes of Israel. He works seven more years now for Rachel. He stays there. He's working the herds. A lot of things take place with Uncle Laban. He's, he's wanting to leave. He's wanting to return back to Cana, to his father's territory. Um, that's the land that God had promised them, and he wanted to return back. He knew that he was, it was uncertain what was going to happen with Esau, but in his heart, he just wanted to go home. He just wanted to go home. He just wanted to go home. How many has ever been in that place? Not physically speaking, but, but, but spiritually speaking, you're away from home, and you just want to go home. You just want to go home. You just want to go home. That's where I was many years ago in Lakeland, Florida, on that college campus. I said, I want to go home. I want to go home. It wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't West Virginia that was pulling me. It was something spiritually that was pulling me, something I'd seen, something I'd kind of experienced, something I'd spectated, something I was longing for that was missing from my life. And Jacob just wanted to go home. Him and Uncle Laban are not working the details out of this departure very well at all. Uncle Laban sticks Jacob with the, the runts of the herd, the, the, literally, literally the black sheep, which was not considered the choice sheep, and the speckled sheep, which were also considered culls. But he stays there longer than what he wanted to. In fact, it would be around 35 years total before Jacob would ever return home. But he has a plan, and he begins to take his culled sheep, and he begins to breed them with Laban's choice sheep. And he ends up with this incredible herd. And he decides it's time to go back home. So he gathers up his wife and the children that they have had, and, and he starts home. Some things happen along the way that messes up Jacob's plans. His daughter is, ends up with a king's son in another village, and he takes advantage of her, and two of Jacob's sons get very upset. And that, it's a funny story, actually. They come up with a plan for revenge. This, this prince, as it were, wants to marry her. Her name is Dinah, and he wants to marry her so bad, and she wants to marry him. But, but culturally speaking, it is improper how this whole thing has happened. And Jacob's two sons are so upset about it. So they come up with this plan. They say, you can have our sister in marriage um, but you, you all have to be circumcised like us or you can't be part of our family. And so the, the king says, well, that, then that's what we'll do. And he announces to the, to the whole town, you're all going to be circumcised so that we can become one with Jacob's household. And, and so all the guys are circumcised. And while they're weak and in pain from this surgical procedure, um, Jacob's sons and their little band of warriors go in and kill them all. And they can't fight back because they're too weak. It looked like a good plan. Jacob said, what have you guys done here? Now the word's going to spread all through Cana. And everyone that doesn't like us, they're going to band together as one. And they're going to come and kill us. And Jacob is distraught. He's been carrying so much weight. How am I going to work this thing out with Esau, which did end up working out okay? He's got that all settled. But now he, he's worried what are we going to do? What am I going to do? He's distraught. He is at a place where he is feeling so lost in life. Physically, he's right back where he thought he wanted to be. And how many can relate to that? You got the house you want. You got the three cars you want. You've got the job you want. You've got uh, the bass boat that you want. Uh, you've got everything that you thought that you wanted. You're in the place, physically speaking, that you thought you wanted to be. But inside, you're feeling so lost. And so empty. And that's where Jacob was. I want to pick the story back up because God comes to Jacob and gives Jacob some instruction. And the instruction is not just for Jacob. It's for anybody who has had an encounter with God, been in a place where they knew that them and God were connecting God was using them. God was speaking to them. They were flowing in anointing. They were flowing in gifts. 
now they physically have what they want, but internally, they're just feeling lost and empty. We pick the story back up here in Genesis. It says, then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods. I'll tell you more about that in a second to let you know how, how bad this family had become. Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress, who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell upon the towns all around them so, so that no one pursued them, which was Jacob's concern. And Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Cana. There he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. This is a story of a man who had an encounter with God. God's presence became real to him. And he continued his journey and slowly got lost. How many of you guys here, and I know some of you, uh, Cornerstone is a church where, where we have kind of uh, crunched the numbers through the years, and at least 50% of this church was unchurched prior to coming here. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. There's, there's probably uh, 500 people who call Cornerstone Family Church their home, and half of them were unchurched before coming here. That's how this church was built. It was tooled to reach the unchurched. So I use a lot of terms that aren't always familiar. But how many are familiar with the, the term backslidden? If you grew up in church, I know you're familiar with it. What does that mean? It means I, was, I had an encounter with God. I was on a journey. I was heading in this direction. I was, God was over there. He's calling me. He's wooing me. I'm coming. I'm coming. And then suddenly something happens, and I find myself backing up. The writer of Hebrews talks about people who shrink back, shrink back. He said, we don't want to be like those people who, who shrink back away from God, backslide away from God. Now, I grew up in church where, where more often than not, if you sneeze in the wrong direction, you were lost again and you had to get saved again. Thank God those mentalities are, are pretty much dying out in the American church. Um, and we're understanding that, that grace is a little bit bigger than what we thought. To be in a backslidden condition doesn't mean that necessarily that if you die, your, your, your history, no eternal life with God. But backslidden is a, is, a, is a place where you have known God, you've been on fire for God, and now you're not where you were close to God, and now you're not. Where God was using you, and now he's not. A place where inside you were feeling the, the abundant life of Jesus. You were feeling his life in you, and now you're not. And I go back again to that place of, because this is the terminology that I grew up with that I relate to, being on fire for God. Being in a place where God was using you. He was showing you things. He was revealing things to you. You were prophesying over people. You were praying for people. You were laying hands on people. Now you're not. The Bible calls it shrinking back, sliding away. It's the story of Jacob. And God's <laughs> prescription was real simple. He said, Jacob, just, just return back to where you were. Just go back. It was Bethel. It was the house of God. And, and, it, and it speaks of that place where the initial connection with God, experience with God, 
began. So just go back to where you were. He told his family, it's like, hey, we've gotten real lost along the way. We're pretty messed up. I know you guys have idols. You've got all kinds of foreign gods. It's got to change. We're going to go back. We're going to purify ourselves. We're even going to change our clothes. Talked about removing their earrings, and that wasn't, that wasn't a diss on earrings. Um, culturally speaking, earrings were worn by men commonly, and the earrings represented the God that you worshipped. Clearly, these earrings did not represent Jehovah. So get rid of your earrings. Get rid of your idols. Get rid of your clothes. Change your clothes. How symbolic is that? Just come back home. Just come back home. Just come back. Here's the thing about the backslider. And first of all, nobody ever wants to see themselves as that. If you grew up in church, you never want to be called that because there's just, the way that word was presented was, it was not good. All kinds of negative connotations. But if we be honest and we be real and we take that term and we look at our lives, the reality is in America today, in the church, in, in churches like this all across America, there is probably huge numbers of people sitting in the congregation that is in a backslidden condition, that is shrinking back, that is not as close to God as they used to be, that is not being used of God the way they used to be. I can relate to to being in places in my life where it's like God was in my face constantly. His presence was just, was just coursing through my veins. And just like I was constantly hearing him and seeing him and feeling him and just prophesying over people and putting hands on people and seeing incredible things. And I know what it's like then to suddenly down the road find myself in a situation where none of that is happening anymore. I'm still saved. And I don't know what happened. The, the, what I talked about last week, the distractions of life, the attractions of life. We get seduced very, very easily. I don't want to get on last week's soapbox, but how many Christians in America today legitimately are in backslidden conditions because of the distraction of social media alone? You used to pray. You used to spend time with God. You used to be in His Word. Now you're only in Facebook. All kinds of distractions. We used to pick at the lake and the bass boats and all that because that used to be the common summer distraction that drew people away. And we have it every year. We have one to two families every single summer that we never see get back in here. And my wife and I was talking the other day with, with tears in our eyes talking about the families that were on fire for God, the distractions of summer hit. They were pulled away. They lost contact with the church. They lost contact with God. And the percentage of them that ended up divorced and their families falling apart. But the last time we saw them, they were on fire for God. We think about the extreme, so we don't want to think about ourselves as being one who is shrinking back. But I want you to know, I battle the shrinking scenario often in my life. I was telling Erica um, just this, this weekend, at, uh, at sometime during the race, about how, I think it was after the varmint yesterday, how you know there's a part of my heart that, that wants to run more miles and wants just to run half marathons and, 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 and stuff like that. But the but the, the training time is very demanding. It's very evasive into your, into your life schedule. And, and I just told her, I said, you know what? I, I just can't. I, I don't think I've got room for that in my life. And I, and I told her, I said, I, 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 I know. I know that some of the injuries that I've had that has contained me to smaller races, it's probably God's way of saying, buddy, you can't handle the distractions of that kind of schedule and stay plugged into me. He's right. He's right. Where are you at today? Where are you at in your walk with God? I want you to know that there's a call on your life. God's got plans for you. 
But the call and the plan of God is not going to force itself into your life. You have to set aside the stuff of life. You have to become intentional. You've got to find your way back to Bethel, the place of God, where you have an encounter with God, where you've had an experience with God, where you felt the presence of God. How many here today could tell us stories about scenarios where you used to find yourself in the presence of God, but now you don't? How many people would come into a church like this and, and be in praise and worship and some people lost in the presence of God? Other people would say, I used to feel that, now I don't. And would honestly justify what's going on in their life by saying, well, I'm just not feeling at that place anymore, at that church anymore. I want you to know, it, there's nothing we can do up here that we're not already doing to draw you into the presence of God. The presence of God is in this place. There are people around you that, that, that are they're being flooded with the very glory of God, and you're sitting there, and you're not experiencing it. We've got to get you back to Bethel. My heart's been heavy this week, because if I had to make a guess, it'd probably be very high percentages. 50, 60, 70 percent of the people in pews and chairs today are probably on some level in a backslidden condition. You're not on fire for God the way you used to be. Some of you have had something happen in your life. I've thought of scenarios this week. I, I was burdened this week with, a, with, with the thoughts of the, of the Lot's wife scenario and how they left that place and they started a new journey, and she looked back, and she became frozen there into a pillar of salt. And I've been, been thinking about that just this week in brand new ways. People judge Lot's wife so harshly. She was looking back at her history. She was looking back where she bore her children. She's looking back where, he, where she raised her children. She's looking back at where all her family memories. She was looking back at the town, the only town that she knew. There was, nothing, there was nothing in her that was evil because she looked back. She was being very human, and that's the, that's the whole idea of the story. God's saying it's very human to start on a journey with God because God's the one that said, that, come, come. So they came. It's very human to start on the journey and to suddenly look back at the things that you're leaving behind. And the point of the story is she became frozen in that place. She became a statue. She was salt. But the Bible says that unless salt can be sprinkled, it's of no value. She was a pillar of salt. She was of no value with her life now. Maybe something like that has happened to some of you. Something tragic maybe even has happened in your world, in your life in your family and you've turned and you can't get your eyes off that but you've frozen in that place and that tragedy that disaster the bottom line is is you have lost the life of God because of it and God wants you to be able to weather disasters storms even great loss and not only not lose the fire of God but God would plan to use that situation to draw you into intimacy beyond what you've ever experienced before. God is close to the brokenhearted. He is drawing, he's looking for those opportunities when we're breaking to get through all those cracks and invade parts of our life that he's never been in before. Where are you at today? God wanted Jacob to know it's not that hard to come back to Bethel, son. It's not that hard. There's no weeping and wailing. There's no putting ashes on your head. There's no sackcloth. There's no crying out. There's no trying to get 10 anointed preachers behind you all, anointing you and laying hands on you. Just come back. We have so many practices and so many methods and so many protocols and procedures that we use on people almost like witchcraft to get them into the place of God. It's just a simple thing in here. Just come home. Just like that, you can make that decision, just like you initially made the decision, just like that, that you wanted him. Come back. Come back. Let the fire of God invade your life. Now, here's what we're going to do. 
because this is all on you. First of all, it's going to be on you to be honest with where you're at in your life today. Can you be real enough to understand that if you're in a backslidden condition, it doesn't mean that God has thrown you away and that you're not his child anymore. Can you, can you handle some conviction today without condemnation? Can you handle getting real with yourself? And do you have the desire, remembering how sweet it was, the life of God, the fire of God, the anointing of God flowing through your life, the joy of God, the peace of God, the confidence in God. Are you missing it? Then we're just going to come home. Guys, get all my bells and whistles on over there. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to establish the presence of God here. And we're just going to come home. I want you to stand with me this morning. If you want the life of God, like you used to have the life of God, you want the life of God more than you've ever experienced the life of God. Maybe, you, maybe some of you need to come to Bethel for the first time today. I want you to come up here with me. Just come up here with me. Say, I want the life of God. Some of you have been used by God in incredibly powerful ways. And it's not happening anymore. Stop missing it and just come back to it. Just come back. Just come back. This is the verse about Jacob. Father, I'm returning to things I used to do. Because somewhere on this journey, I think I lost hold of the truth. But nothing really satisfies Like when you speak my name So tell me that you'll never leave And everything will be okay Say this with me to him Cause in your presence, all fear is gone. In your presence, in your presence is where I belong. In your presence, this is the verse about Moses. Father, I am waiting I need to hear from you To know that you're approving What I say and do Cause nothing really satisfies Yeah Like when you speak my name So tell me that you'll never leave And everything will be the same Can we stretch our hands up and say this? In your prayer all fear is gone in your presence. We 
return to you, Lord. In your presence is where I feel. In your presence, come on, sing that. seems silly to the world, but I hear this song this morning crying out, we're going to redeem it. I hear this as our song. My heart's a stereo. It beats for you, solace and close. Hear my thoughts in every note. Bang me your radio, turn me up, I worship you. This melody was meant for you. Well, well if I could only find a note to make you understand. I'd sing a song and the music take you by the hand. Keep myself inside your head Like your favorite tune And make myself a stereo That only plays for you Do you guys get the meaning of that? My heart's a stereo It beats for you solace and close Hear my thoughts in every note well, 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 so make me your radio, turn me up, I worship you, this melody was meant for you, well, well, well. Lord, we return to you today, we return to you today, we return to you today we return. I pray today, oh God, that you will draw us, draw us back initially to that place we used to be with you, and then take us beyond. Today, Lord, I, I, I call for the wells to be opened back up that the Philistines have filled with dirt. I say, wells, be open and let fresh water flow. Lord, as they stand here before you in your presence, May the flame of God be fanned in their life. 
teach them, Holy Spirit, how to get back to their Bethel. Show them the journey. Show them how to get back. Show them, teach them how to fan the flame of God in them. Teach them, Holy Spirit. I declare a restirring, a fresh anointing in this place. The anointing of God that I know you've put in them. Lord, I cry out for it to be stirred fresh today. Fresh life, fresh fire, fresh peace, fresh joy. Fresh intimacy, fresh desire. I call for new love to awaken. Can you just sing this last little chorus with me? Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I found, leaves the 99. Oh, I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give your life away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Say that. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. Oh, I couldn't hurt it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give your life away. Say that again. Oh, I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give your life away. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give your life away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love. Breathe him in, guys. Just breathe him in. I want to tell you something. If you will carve out some time for God carve out some time for God and watch him light your fire spend some time with God and watch what God's going to do in you there are some of you standing up here right now that God has called to do incredible things he has called you to teach he's called you to preach he's called you to prophesy he's called you to lay hands on people and see incredible things He's called you to speak to things. Never be satisfied with just being saved. You will live an empty life just being saved, I'm telling you. Come on, sing this song as we end. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I found, leaves the 99. Oh, I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give your life away, I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give your life away, oh, the love of God. How many of y'all feel better now than when you came here? Can I see your hand? Because I feel a lot better. Give the Lord some praise in this place. 
And those of you that will be in town next week, come and let's celebrate Father's Day. And let's just have a blast. I don't know what we're going to do. I want you to know it's, it's summer Sundays. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know who's going to be playing what instrument. I just know at some point this Sunday, you're going to see me playing a banjo up here. I'm just feeling the anointing begin to flow for that. And if this, it may be the Sunday you're planning on missing, so don't miss that. <laughs>